Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Alex White from uh, K Johnson G. I'm a tax partner. And today we're going to look at R&D tax credit relief, which is a very valuable relief. Um, so I'll be taking you through the types of company that can qualify, the two schemes that are specific to the R&D claim, the hurdles or the criterion that you need to meet as a business uh, to claim the relief, which can only be claimed by companies. So unfortunately, if you're a partnership or a sole trader, you, you can't claim it. And, and then once we've gone through that, we'll go through the costs you can claim. And then finally, we'll, we'll finish with some real examples of claims that we've done here for, for our clients, just to give you a flavor. I think it's important whilst some of what I'm going to speak about is possibly a tad dry, that, you know, rest assured, you don't need to be Bill Gates who created Microsoft uh, or, or NASA to, to claim this relief. Many of our clients uh, meet the various criterion and are able to make claims. So, what are the two different levels of relief? The first one is what's called the SME scheme, which is small, medium enterprises, what it stands for. And that basically gives you an additional 130% relief against your taxable profits for the costs that you've incurred on your R&D activity. So, for example, if you've spent a hundred pounds on R&D, that's already gone through your, your profit loss account, so you're already going to get relief for that. What this does is give you another £130 to reduce your taxable profits. So it's incredibly valuable, particularly under the SME scheme. Uh, and certainly some of our clients have generated tax refunds, you know, in, in six figures, you know, over £100,000. If the additional relief that you incur for example, actually creates a loss for tax purposes, you can either deal with that loss in the normal way, carry it back one year or carry it forward against the same trade, or you can actually sell that loss to the government uh, at a rate of 14%, it's not as valuable as the full corporation tax rate currently of 19%. But that's actually quite useful, particularly if you're in a startup uh, where you're possibly burning a lot of cash and cash now is, is more important than reducing future profits. Then if you're, if you're not an SME, and we'll come on to what those definitions are, then you can claim it under what's called the Large Company Scheme, or RDEC for short. That basically means where you've spent £100 in my earlier example, you get another £30 relief, so not as valuable against your, your taxable profits. And the way the accounting works is that that credit is then actually taxable. So on your £30 extra, you will then pay 19%. So it's not as valuable. It's, it's still useful, don't get me wrong. But clearly, if you can get into the SME scheme, then, then that's far better. And then the claims we tend to make generally for our clients, because that's, that's our, 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 our client base. So for the SME scheme, you've got to have fewer than 500 employees as a starter for 10. Now, that's full-time equivalents, so you could have 750 employees, but if a large number of those employees are part-time or their job shares, you can still get within the 500 full-time equivalent test. If you pass that test, you then look at two other tests. Either your turnover is less than 100 million euro, or your gross assets, are less than 86 million. Why is this in euros? It's because this is a state aid uh, initiative and it's therefore been connoted in euros. Not sure what happens after the end of the year when Brexit actually happens, uh, but they're the parameters at the moment. So that's really the scheme you want to be in if you can. But what is, what is R&D from, from a technical point of view, from what the revenue uh, set out in their biz guidelines and in their manuals? Well, basically, it's got to be part of a project that you're working on uh, that produces an advance in science or technology. It must obviously relate to your, your trade, either one that you're already currently carrying on or one that you're intending to start on the, on the back of the R&D you undertake. 
So what sort of projects count as R&D? Well, first of all, you need to explain that what you're doing is looking for an advance in the fields of science and technology. That when you started your project, you didn't know how to get to the end result. There would be trial and error, uh, which is a, one of the key features of R&D. Tried that, it didn't work. Let's, let's try something new and start again. And, it, and it's something that an expert in the field couldn't just go, oh, I know the answer to that because clearly that, that knowledge is already there. It, it's got to be something that an expert can't readily come up with, and hence you've got to go through this whole R&D process. And in terms of that process, it can be an actual physical process, a manufacturing process, it could be a brand new product, or a service, or it, just to improve an existing one. But clearly that improvement needs to be sufficient in scale to actually warrant it as R&D rather than just a minor tweak to an existing process. So how do you show that you've looked for an advance? So you need to create an advance in the overall field, not just for your business. So something might be new to you, but it's not new across the whole piece. And that's what you've got to demonstrate. So it's something that they use the phrase increases the stock of knowledge so if it's already out there but you're using it for the first time you you won't qualify the only time where you could have it already out there and you qualify for r d is if you don't know how another company has, has got the result they they achieved a prime example here would be formula one ferrari are developing their car which they clearly need to do a bit more of this season to you know, reduce drag, increase downforce through you know, tweaks in aerodynamics or what have you. Well, Renault are trying to do the same thing as our McLaren, but none of those firms now know how the, the other team is doing it. So it's not readily out there already. So in that particular instance, you would still qualify. You have to show there's uncertainty that the answer isn't readily known it isn't easily found or discovered uh, and i mentioned that you know an expert in the field just you know just doesn't give the answer with three seconds and, and, and i always think a good indica indicator of uncertainty is that trial and error has taken place you, you've tried to uh, resolve an issue or create a new product uh, and your efforts have not been successful and you have to go back to the drawing board i, I think that's a good indicator that there's some uncertainty in the project. You've also got to be able to demonstrate how you overcame that uncertainty. Again, that would be through trial and error, through analysis of results, of testing, etc., and be able to describe that to the revenue if asked. Um, so there will be some successes as you go along that path, but equally trial and error, there will be some failures. So you need to have a process clearly documented of how you went about trying to overcome uncertainty. As I mentioned earlier, you've also got to be able to demonstrate that the answer wasn't readily found or easily explained. So you need to be able to demonstrate that a professional in that field couldn't quickly work it out and say, all ah, right, to do that, we just need to do ABC because that will probably not be R&D, because you've got to go through all that uncertainty, not knowing quite how you're going to overcome those difficulties that you face. When I've had the odd, and I've only had a couple, of HMRC inquiries into R&D claims we've done, they are quite keen on knowing who's in the team and what qualifications they have, such that you can prove, actually, the people we, we employ and who are carrying out this activity do know what they're doing. They are experts in their field and they didn't readily know the answer. Um, so that's just something, again, to be mindful of. So that's a kind of brief overview of what is R&D, what do you need to demonstrate uh, to the revenue if queried in terms of how you've gone about carrying out your R&D activity but what are the things that you can claim 
normally the biggest cost are the salaries of those actually engaged in the R&D activity within your business. So that is their, their gross salary, employers, national insurance, and any pension contributions, but excludes benefits in kind, et cetera. You can also claim where you subcontract some of the work or you've got agency workers. You can also claim on materials and consumables that are used up in the process. So if as part of my R&D, uh, I had to melt some uh, alloy or aluminium uh, to create something, and at the end of that, that is spent and can't be reused, then you could claim the cost for that because you've used it up as part of the R&D process. And also you can claim for some types of software. When can you claim? Well, you can claim certain costs on the project from the date you start actually working on that project until you've actually got an end result and the R&D finishes. The revenue are quite keen on, on this and you being able to demonstrate it that you're not claiming past the point in which the uncertainty uh, has been resolved. So again, this is all about documenting internally what are people doing, how much time they're spending on it, what costs have been incurred, and when can we say, hand on heart, that project is finished and now we're starting a new one. So, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of staff costs, that's their salaries, wages, employees' national insurance, and employer pension fund contributions. And you work out the appropriate percentage of those. If you're developing software, you may well have some software developers, that's all they do all day long. So the proportion of their time could be quite high, say 70%. Whereas if you've got someone, say, in the admin team supporting that research, the percentage of their time might only be 5%. But that's all claimable. Uh, the revenue do look out for cases where people claim that a staff member is 100% R&D because clearly that probably isn't the case uh, and they are quite aware of that. So again, it's all about record keeping. So as I mentioned, as part of a claim, you may have a little bit of allocation of cost in terms of the admin or support staff who work and support the main R&D team, but you can't claim for normal clerical or maintenance work um, like managing a payroll. That's, you can't allocate that part to R&D. That's just a normal internal function. Of your, of your business, but you can claim 65% of any payments if you engage any external agency staff who are working on that R&D project. I mentioned that you might subcontract part of your R&D. It's not uncommon for companies to maybe subcontract some of their R&D activities out to say places like India, or they may subcontract some of the testing to, to a third party. If that's the case, then you can claim 65% of what that subcontractor invoices you. This is a bit of a rule of thumb. There's no sign to this. The revenue have just decided that 35% of, of that invoice represents the subcontractor's profit margin and so quite rightly shouldn't be included as a cost in your claim. If your subcontractor is connected, i.e. you may have subcontracted that research to another company in your group, then there are special rules where you can either claim 65% of the invoice or 100% of their costs. Uh, and you can do that whichever way it works in, in your favour. You just need to make sure that the subcontractor you use isn't, isn't claiming R&D themselves for what, for what they're doing for you. Um, but again, so it's a useful added um, cost to increase the size of your claim. Consumables. As I mentioned, you might use up materials in, as part of your R&D process, as, as part of going through that trial and error and uncertainty we mentioned earlier. So you do something, doesn't work, and you have to skip it, then the materials involved can be claimed. Equally, a small amount of utilities can normally be claimed. For example, if in your premises, you have a specific area where the R&D activity is undertaken and based on floor space, that represents 10% of your overall building. 
you could claim 10% of your heat and light as, as part of that claim. Software costs. If you've had to uh, expend money on specific software costs or their generic software, but that software is being used in, in the R&D process, then again, you can include these in the claim. The revenue wouldn't expect to see big numbers for software costs or for the uh, utilities costs. So it's, it's about making the claim look and, and, and feel right. It's important also, given we've gone through costs that you can claim, what are those costs you can't? As I mentioned in relation to staff costs, you can't claim for benefits in kind, et cetera. And also you can't claim for distribution. If you have to buy a machine, you can't claim as that as, as part of, of this R&D. There are special allowances, but you can't include it in your R&D claim. If you've bought some land to build your factory on, or, or the costs of acquiring patents and trademarks, or your rent and rates. It's got the costs that you can claim are ones that are far more specific to your R&D activity. So, hopefully that's uh, been useful uh, to give you a, a bit of a taster, start for 10, on what's R&D all about. But in, in terms of the successful claims we've had, and there's some there on the screen in front of you, I mean, some of them are fairly obvious, software development, I mean, you need to make sure that your software is, is unique or is doing something unique. The revenue will not accept a claim if you've just replaced a paper system with a system that people fill in on screen. That, that's, that's not R&D. But if there's something really clever going on at the back end, then you might have a claim. Equally, you might have existing hardware, computers, printers. But if you've developed some software that makes those two pieces of hardware talk to each other in a very specific and unique way, you may have a claim. New varnishes. I was involved with a client who developed wood varnishes, clear, clear varnishes, matte varnishes, etc. And when we kind of, that doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Or, or scientific. But when we were talking to the client and got to know them better, you know, they were kind of doing nanotechnology in terms of how long their, their varnish would, would stay usable once you've opened the tin, also, how, uh, how viscous it was in terms of uh, applying it to different uh, surfaces, which goes into its chemical properties. And, and we also looked at the technology they used in terms of actually applying their, their varnishes. And, and they basically de developed almost like a, a paint spray gun um, to, be, to be able to do that. And also how varnishes react to, to heat, to light, etc. Um, oil well capping. Uh, this was technology around sealing off oil wells uh, that if they needed to be opened up again made it made it a lot easier. Uh, dental implants that was looking at basically the materials that made up those dental implants uh, to make them uh, last longer, be more comfortable, etc. So there's chemistry in that. Um, I was also just as an aside, I was involved in a business that created essences for, for drinks, manufacturers, etc. And again, that all came down to chemistry of how we put together different things to create a unique essence. And the final one there on my list is powered wheelchairs for, for those who are unfortunately uh, um, have a disability but want to engage in, in football, this, this, um, in sport generally, and this one was particularly in football. And there, you're just not taking a normal wheelchair and sticking a, a motor on it. You, you've got to actually look at speed of rotation, uh, look at the tyre technology, uh, how the wheelchair was controlled for people with severe disabilities who may only have movement of their head. So you've got to factor all those things in. Uh, and again, that, that was another successful claim uh, that we did for, for, that, for that particular client. So hopefully you found that informative. Uh, we've been doing R&D claims ever since the legislation uh, came in many, many moons ago. So we have a vast amount of experience in this area. It's a very valuable relief uh, to reduce uh, your corporation uh, tax payable 
or to make uh, apply for a tax refund. You can go back two years. Many of our newer clients, we say, hey, have you done R&D? Let's have a look. And we find out they've not made a claim. Uh, we've been able to do that. And we've got sizable refunds back, back from HMRC, which is always a good feeling. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, if you've got any R&D queries, please get in touch uh, and have a great rest of your day. Cheers.